Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Computational Science Colloquium Series. Today, I have the pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Perry Johnson, who is an assistant professor at this institute, and he's going to talk to us about the physics of simulation of turbulent. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, so, I will structure my talk today like this in this sort of chiastic structure. So first, in the first half, I'll, I'll give some background. So I'll talk about the, the physics of turbulence and, and how we compute it or how we can't compute it. I'll talk about an idea called large eddy simulation that's gaining a lot of traction in the, the, I, in the field of simulating turbulence, particularly as it relates to, the, to spatial filtering, uh, which is the framework we usually think about for large eddy simulation. And then that'll lead to some discussion of the physics of turbulence in terms of what's called the energy cascade and how that relates to sub subgrid models you need for these large eddy simulations. And then sort of walking it back, I'll show how some of my work has, has driven new insights into the physics of the energy cascade and then how this can be used to develop a new framework for thinking about LES going beyond just spatial filtering, generating ideas for how to address more complex physics um, in, in a generalized framework. And I'll, I'll close with some outlook on computing turbulence. All right, so let me start out by giving a little overview of turbulence from a physical perspective and how that relates to how we think about computing. So turbulence is a continuum phenomena that arises from the Navier-Stokes equations, which govern fluid flow. In particular, in a fluid flow, you have nonlinear advection, and then you have pressure gradient forces and viscous forces. So the key parameter for fluid flows is the Reynolds number, which you can think of as just a ratio of the strength of this nonlinear advection to the viscous smoothing term. So it depends on the, the viscosity, which is the property of the fluid you're working with. Typically in engineering, common fluids we work with, such as water and air, have relatively low viscosities in terms of SI units. You can think of this as low viscosities in terms of sort of the human scale which means at the human scale, we, we often run into high Reynolds numbers. And the high Reynolds numbers is where we get turbulent flows rather than amber flows. So let me just skip, sketch out a few examples just to give you a flavor. So in gas turbine engines, you have a compressor, the flow goes through a compressor, a combustor, and then a, the, the turbine. After the combustor, the gases are very hot. In fact, they're hot enough to melt the turbine components if you don't have an active cooling scheme which is shown here. Here's a picture of a turbine blade. Right after the combustor, you see all these holes in it. That's where you ingest, you inject coolant air to provide a protective covering over the surface and, and uh, protect the materials. And so here's a simulation that I ran when I was just starting to get into CFD uh, of, a, of a jet and cross flow where you're trying to inject this coolant air and getting a nice coverage and, and the turbulent mixing plays a key role in trying to predict the effectiveness of your design. Another example is large scale wind farms. Here's an offshore wind farm off the coast of Denmark that's very famous. Where actually, this is actually a picture where the fog, is, the, the atmospheric conditions were just right. So the fog showed up just in the wake of the turbines. So you can see the downstream turbines uh, get blocked by the upstream turbines depending on the wind direction. And this is all controlled by the turbulent spreading of these wakes behind the turbines. And you can see a, a picture from a simulation uh, below that. Another example, if you remember from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. So basically you had a multi-phase flow coming off the bottom of the seafloor, and that, broke, that would be broken up by the turbulence into small droplets. They would then, if they, were, if they were big enough, they would still rise to the surface. If they were small enough, then there were some currents that, and some mechanisms for tracking smaller oil droplets beneath the surface. So when it came to, you know, should you inject surfactants to try to break the droplets up smaller? How, what effect does that have? Can you estimate how much oil came out of the oil spill by just looking at the surface or how much is trapped beneath? And questions like this were really tough to answer. Uh, where we'd like to have reliable simulations to, to answer some of these questions. And of course, more recently, uh, with the spread of COVID and, and other similar diseases, uh, the role of turbulent sneezes and coughs is very important in terms of these, these clouds of, of turbulent uh, flows with droplets 
uh, in, in the spread of the disease. So these are just a sampling. There are many more turbulent flows of interest in, in various fields in, in science and engineering. But, but the common question is, well, what's so difficult about turbulent flows? <clears throat> so I, I have some historical quotes here. So Horace Lamb wrote a, a famous hydrodynamics book uh, close to er early 19th century. And in that book, he called turbulence the chief outstanding difficulty of our subject, the subject being fluid mechanics. Uh, Richard Feynman, in his famous uh, lectures on physics, called turbulence the central problem which we ought to solve someday. And Peter Bradshaw, a Stanford engineering professor in the 90s, um, in one of his papers, postulated that turbulence was invented by the devil but to sort of torment us as engineers and scientists. So what's so difficult about it? What, what leads to these sort of colorful descriptions of, of the problem of turbulence? So let's look at this. Here's a fluorescent image of a, of a turbulent jet. So you can see here, the jet spreads and it has these sort of coherent motions you can see by these sort of group, sort of coherent motions of the fluorescent dye that's been injected. And one, one of the key features of turbulent flow is that it enhances the dissipation rate. So the dissipation rate is when viscous friction turns kinetic energy into heat. And this is proportional to the viscosity and the strain rate tensor, the magnitude of the strain rate tensor. So the way, it, what happens in a turbulent flow, you have a larger scale. You can see these larger scale motions tend to be proportional to the size of the width of the jet. And this is where most of the kinetic energy of excitation of turbulence is happening, it's where, you're, where you're creating most of the fluctuation energy. But you also have smaller, you can see smaller and smaller scale features in the jet. And these, you can estimate these uh, using a theory from Komogorov, a Russian scientist, if you have the dissipation rate and the viscosity of the fluid. And this is the scale where viscous smoothing takes over. Now, what happens when we increase the Reynolds number of a flow? When we have high Reynolds number, the ratio of these two length scales, the large, largest scale and the smallest scale of turbulence, grows almost linearly with Reynolds number. So you get a wide range of scales when you have large Reynolds number turbulent flows. And within these large, this large range of scales, you have strongly nonlinear multi-scale interactions across this wide range. And so this is not very easily tackled in terms of our classical treatments of uh, mathematics. So why not just simulate it, right? Let's just simulate it. If we can't come up with analytical solutions or good analytical models. So let's see, can we do a direct numerical simulation? So that means just basically discretizing the Navier Stokes equations. Here I have it for the incompressible flows. So I have a divergence free field. And I need a grid spacing that'll be proportional to my smallest scale, eta, the polar up scale. So let's think about what this looks like. Let's go back to this wind farm example. So in this wind farm example, the spacing between these wind turbines is half a kilometer. And there it's, it's uh, I believe like a seven by seven array. And if I really want to resolve the smallest scales of turbulent motion, I need a grid that's probably less than a millimeter in terms of my grid space. So I'm talking about more than a million grid points in each direction. This is close to a trillion times more expensive than the current largest direct numerical simulation of, a, of turbulence that's been run. So that's a 16,000 cube grid has been run on a lot, one of the large uh, DOE supercomputers. So even if you assume the current exponential growth rate, this is gonna be, we're talking about 50 or 60 years before we can even come close to simulating a flow like this via brute force methods. And that's assuming linear scaling. The, the methods used for the 16 cube grid are actually based on Fourier transforms. So there you have n log n for, a, for an FFT. And even then, we're only talking about one hero calculation on the world's largest machine, right? We're not talking about a, an engineering design scenario where I can run many different scenarios and, and judge between them and learn something. And I haven't even really taken into account the effect of boundary layers. So on each of these wind turbine blades, I even need a much finer resolution locally to capture the boundary layer dynamics. So even that is quite an underestimate of how long it will take before we can simulate this type of flow. And on top of that, if we look at the trends in supercomputing, here is the, um, the performance as a function of time of the, the 
n equals one, so the, the world's largest supercomputer, uh, the average of the top 500, and then the sum of the top 500. So for all you had exponential growth, you can see lately it's slowing down. That this exponential growth is slowing down. And will this slow down continue? So let's look at, there's an interesting comparison we can think about. So here is a chart of the summit, which was the number one, world's number one supercomputer when it was built in 2018. It's now number two to a Japanese machine. It's power consumption to run it and it's cost to build it. And let's think about this compared to the Large Hadron Collider that CERN has built in Europe, right? So particle physics is an interesting comparison to supercomputing. In particle physics, you had also decades of exponential growth in terms of the collision energy generated for these particle colliders. But you can see locally, here's the hydrogen collider here. It's sort of slowed down even stuff. It actually didn't become operational until close to 2010, right? So it's even more slowed down, almost flattening off. And that's because you can see the power it takes to run it and the cost it takes to build it requires huge public investment to, to support this kind of work. And if you compare the scale in terms of the power that it takes to run these, these world-class supercomputers and the cost that it takes to build it now, El Capitan is, is scheduled at Lawrence Livermore to be finished in 2023. And here are some estimates that I pulled from that. We're actually getting to the scale in supercomputing where it's comparable to these huge uh, collider investments, right? <clears throat> so there's a real question of, you know, I don't think we can take continued exponential growth in supercomputing for granted, uh, even to make the kind of estimates I made on the previous slide. So all that to say, um, Direct numerical simulation, a brute force approach is not going to get us very far uh, for a lot of practical engineering problems anytime soon. So let's consider some alternatives. And, and a very popular one is large eddy simulation. It's built on the idea of spatial filtering. So here's the basic idea. So the brute force approach, direct numerical simulation, I'm just simulating out of the stokes. Maybe I have some forcing function here that I add to it. And here, here's, a, here's an example picture. This one's at a relatively modest Reynolds number. So in this case, right, I need a, my domain size is L, it's the length of these largest scale motions. And then you can see the small scale motions, eta, right? And so the number of grid points is that ratio cubed because it's three dimensional. And so it's more than Reynolds number squared, this sort of scaling, just in terms of the number of grid points, that doesn't take into account also the time stepping, right? Which is gonna get more expensive. And so here's an example with a trillion grid points for this simulation. So a thousand grid points in each direction. Um, but for LES, I want to say, well, I want, I want to run something on a coarser grid. So I can think of doing a, a low pass filter. So I do a convolution operator on my velocity vector with some, uh, some kernel G has some characteristic length scale L. And I can derive the equations for how this coarser field is going to evolve by filtering the Navier-Stokes equations, and I pick up this subgrid stress tensor sigma due to the nonlinear terms. And I can use this equation to solve for a smooth version of the flow. And let's say I, I use a much coarser grid so I can get away with something like 10 to the five grid points, much cheaper, because I only need my grid size proportional to whatever filter scale I'm thinking about using. So this is much more realistic when we think about how to simulate hybrid simple flow. The catch is that we have to come up with some way to write a model for what sigma is. So this is, is the net force of my unresolved motions on the resolved motion, on, on the resolved scale. So one way, another way to sort of visualize spatial filtering, again, is a convolution operator. If I think about it in Fourier space, convolution just becomes pre-multiplying by a transfer function. So I can take the FFT of my filter kernel, and basically, here's my spectrum without the filter. You can see there's a nice power law scaling that's well known uh, in turbulence theory. And then when my wave number gets close to the Komogorov scale, this, so large wave number means very rapid oscillations in space. So small scales, eventually it drops off because there's not much energy at, at smaller scales than eta. And if I do a filtering, basically what I'm doing is this, this transfer function is killing off high wave number modes uh, in my simulation as I increase the filter scale L. And so I can get rid, get away with much uh, lower resolution and still uh, simulate the filtered field. For example, I can think of a Gaussian filter here with some exponential 
shape of the filter function. In your Fourier space, it's also the same Gaussian shape. So the basic idea, right, if I do spatial filtering, it's a nice way to remove small scales and be able to simulate on a coarser mesh. There's a couple problems with it. One, let's, in many, in many problems in engineering, I need to have a non-uniform grid resolution. In some regions of the domain, I want finer resolution to know what's going on. In other domains, uh, less fine resolution. So let's take a filter kernel that's, that changes as I go to different locations in the flow. In this case, when I filter a gradient, it does, the filter doesn't commute with the gradient operator. Instead, it generates a commutator error. So now my filtered Navier-Stokes equations include these extra commutator error terms. And my divergence-free condition is now I have a divergence in my filtered velocity field because of this commutator error. So that's one. Another is how do we do turbulence near boundaries and interfaces? And in general, in more complex flow. So if I have a wall, some solid boundary here, I have a turbulence near the wall and I want to filter it. Here's sort of the, the domain in which my filter uh, averages. It's sort of like a local average nearby. And if I get close to the wall, now my filter is asking for information outside of the flow. How do I do that? In multi-phase flow, let's say I have some deforming drop or bubble in my turbulent flow. So turbulence is deforming, maybe even breaking this up. If I do, if I filter this, now I'm going to sort of blur out this interface and, and I lose a lot of the distinct features of, of a sharp interface where I have forces like surface tension, things like that. And so these are some things to think about in terms of spatial filtering for LES. Spatial filtering is, is the classical approach, um, but, but let's sort of move on. I'll come back to it. Let's think now physically, even in the simple case, let's say I don't have walls or interface. I'm, I'm away from walls and interfaces, and I don't have more compl complex physics going on necessarily. What do I need to do for modeling, and, and how can I use the physics of turbulence to construct accurate models? So the basic physics of turbulence, again, away from walls and a high Reynolds numbers, can be sketched out very cartoonishly like this. You generate fluctuating energy at large scales, where it steals energy from the shear flow. and then through the successive process, the energy gets passed to smaller and smaller scales until eventually the energy in the, the more rough scales, the smallest scales energize, and now viscosity uh, takes over and dissipates this energy. So a century ago, the British meteorologist Lewis Richardson wrote a nice poem to describe this. Big worlds have little worlds which feed on their velocity, and little worlds have lesser worlds and so on to viscosity. We captured it. And then Kumal Borov, who is a Russian scientist who, who laid down a lot of the, the fundamental theory of turbulence in, in the 1940s, described it this way, from an energetical point of view, it's natural to imagine the process of turbulent mixing in the following way. Pulsations of the first order absorb the energy of the motion and pass it over successively to pulsations of higher and higher order. The energy of the finest pulsation is dispersed in the energy of heat due to viscosity. So you have this sort of energy cascading effect from large scales to small scales before it's dissipated. And this is how you get from large scale excitation to generating these very small scales in turbulence. How can we use this for modeling? So if we think about this idealized picture of the cascade, just to think about it in a cartoonish way for a second. If we have an LES grid, we have a finite resolution in which we can't resolve these motions at smaller scales. And so as, as the energy is passing, once it, once it gets down to the grid size, we have to do something with that energy, right? So we have resolved scales above the grid. We have subgrid scales for motions smaller than the grid. And we need some model for this effective stress due to these small scales. So the small scale will, have, will do an effective stress that alters the behavior of the larger scale. And fundamentally, it has to do this in such a way that the model must remove energy at the grid scale, right? Because you have energy that's cascading down. You don't want to just pile up at the small scales in your simulation. So you have to, fundamentally, the first thing you need out of your model is the removal of energy at the small scales. All right, so let's talk about how energy is partitioned when we take a spatial filtering approach. So if I filter the field, I can construct the kinetic energy of the 
filtered field by just by the dot product. And then I can construct the rest of the energy by looking at the trace of my subgrid stress tensor at some scale L. And the exchange between these two energies, I can quantify uh, in terms of pi. And so pi here is the inner product between the subgrid stress tensor and the filtered strain rate tensor S. And so I can compute this as a function of space and time in a flow and see how energy is being exchanged between large scales and small scales. One of the most common models uh, to use in large eddy simulation is eddy viscosity model. So basically, this is building an analogy between random molecular motions that lead to the viscous effect we know, and the small scale motions that are unresolved in our simulation, we can think of them as sort of like random molecular motions and model them just with a viscosity. So the stress is just some viscosity times the resolved strain rate. And this leads to a dissipation rate that's positive definite, so that's good. It's removing energy, and it's proportional to my turbulent viscosity, nu t. So I need a model for that. So the first thing to point out here is that if you go into DNS, which you can run at modest Reynolds numbers, and you compute this, there's, there's, no, there's not good empirical support for an eddy viscosity model. It's actually not very accurate. What it does good is, is it removes energy, but it doesn't do it very accurately. So the cascade is not particularly like an eddy viscosity effect, um, but it, it raises the question, well, how can we describe it if we want to get a more accurate picture of what's going on? So let's go back to some of, some of the classic texts on turbulence theory. So G.I. Taylor, a famous British fluid mechanician in the 1930s, did some experiments <clears throat> and concluded, it seems the stretching of vortex filaments must be regarded as the principal mechanical cause of the high rate of dissipation associated with turbulent motion. <clears throat> and Lars Onsager, who is not famous for his work in turbulence, nonetheless wrote a very influential paper on turbulent motions, where he, he similarly concluded the dissipation of energy in turbulent motion must be attributed to the stretching of vortex fibers. And he described it in the context of this cascade, right, where the cascade where the breaking down of energy into smaller, smaller motions is driven by this vortex dynamics. So let me try to draw a little cartoon here to, to motivate what they're talking about. So if I have some vortex tube here with some vorticity, omega, it exists with also, it also in a, strain, a straining field. So it's going to tend to align with stretching directions of the strain. And as it does, it will get stretched out, and as the tube gets stretched out, it will thin out. And just like when a figure skater, when they pull their arms in as they're spinning, they spin faster, the same principle of conservation of angular momentum means that as this vortex tube gets stretched, it will spin faster. So you have energy at larger scales getting, getting stretched into thinner uh, vortex tubes, and with the kinetic energy being passed into more rapid uh, vorticity as well. Scales. So this is a rough sketch. It's cartoonish. You have to imagine this sort of in a chaotic three-dimensional, going on in a chaotic three-dimensional flow, more so in this clean cartoon. But that's the classical view. The energy cascade is driven by this vortex stretching. More recently, some have called this account into question. Um, Arkady Sinover said that the, cas the energy cascade, whatever, this, he was a bit of a skeptic is associated primarily with the quantity, and this is a triple, pro triple product of the strain rate tensor, rather than the entropy production. So this entropy production here is exactly this rate of vortex stretching that I showed on the, on the previous slide. So what's this triple product of strain? Well, most recently, um, Annie Bragg, who does research at, at Duke University, uh, also did a nice study where he was able to conclude vortex stretching is not the main mechanism driving the average energy cascade. The main mechanism driving the average cascade is the strain self amplification process. So that by that, he means this triple product. And this is a fundamentally distinct dynamical process from that of vortex shift. So let me try to draw a cartoon again, just to give some qualitative understanding. So let's say I have some sheet of fluid here where I have three principal directions of the strain rate. And so it's being, let's say it's being stretched in two directions, compressed in a third, and let me look at the velocity profile along this x direction here, which we compressed. Let's say it looks something like this, right? 
we have a we have a negative gradient. That means it's this means it's compressive. So you have higher speed fluid sort of catching up with the lower speed fluid in front of it. And so after some time, you can think of this like a Burger's equation effect, where you'll get a steepening of the negative uh, gradients, a steepening of of the compressive strains uh, in a given flow field, and this generates sort of smaller scale striations in the flow. Again, you have to sort of picture this as going on in a chaotic three-dimensional flow field. So this introduces an alternative ex explanation or alternative mechanism to explain the energy cascade, which we'll call strain self amplification Okay, so let me try to disentangle these two effects um, using some precise analysis and get some new, new insights in the energy cascade physics, and then we'll get back to the question of OES. So this brings me to an alternative perspective on spatial filtering. So I introduced spatial filtering as a convolution operator. I've written it out in full here. It's an integral operator with, with some kind of kernel where you're essentially doing like a local average in the flow over some scale L. Again, with no boundaries interfaces, uniform resolution, let's take the simplest case for now. But let's think of this differently. Let's think of, I take a snapshot of the flow U, I set it as an initial condition and I run a diffusion equation. I run it through a diffusion equation with some pseudo viscosity V hat and some over some pseudo time T hat. So the solution to this equation run on a frozen snapshot of turbulence is exactly the same as the standard integral form, provided I have no boundaries and uniform resolution. It's just this Gaussian filter. <clears throat> We're now looking at U hat and T hat. I can form a relationship between the resolution scale and whatever these artificial parameters that I have set. So what, what, how does this help us to sort of rephrase our integral formulation of, of spatial filtering into a differential one? Well, in particular, you can do some manipulations here with the differential form and get a differential equation for our subject stress tensor, sigma. This is, the, this is what we need to model. And so grouping the, the, the pseudo viscosity and the pseudo time together is L squared. As I increase the, the resolution length scale to larger and larger scales, it follows a forced diffusion equation where it starts at zero and then it gets forced by the gradient of the filtered velocity at each scale as, as the scale is increasing. So this gives a, a relationship for the subbridge stress in terms of velocity gradients at different scales. And this, the velocity gradient is, is a quantity that's made up of vorticity and strain rate. So this allows us to tie in vorticity and strain rate dynamics into the definition of the subject stress tensor and get, some, get a simple relation that looks something like this. The cascade rate, the rate at which energy is cascading across scale L is equal to a sum of vortex stretching terms and strain self amplification terms. So in particular, you'll have five terms. So single scale effects, that means interactions just between sc the scale L, strain self amplification and vortex stretching, and then multi-scale effects where you have, for example, multi-scale multi -scale vortex stretching. So if you have large scale strain, stretching smaller scale vorticity and multi-scale effects like this. So breaking down each term, we have single scale strain self amplification at the filter scale, vortex stretching at the filter scale, then we have multi-scale strain amplification. We have large scale strain amplifying small scale strain at some smaller length scale L prime. Multi-scale vortex stretching, where you have strain at scale L stretching vortices, smaller scale vortices at L prime, where L prime can be anything from essentially zero, essentially the Komogorov scale, the smallest scale, all the way up to L, so over a range of scales. And then this last vortex flattening term, which turns out not to be too important, so I won't talk about it much today. But basically what this gives you is a precise method to evaluate the contributions of these two mechanisms, vortex stretching and strain self amplification, to how much they're driving the energy cascade. So let's look, so I ran a DNS at a relatively modest Reynolds number, so I can complete it in a reasonable amount of time. And then I can compute each of these terms directly <clears throat> as if I had an LES, right, by, by using filtering on the DNS results after the fact. So here, 
First, I plot this yellow curve. This is just the sum of all five terms on the right-hand side, taking the average, and I normalize it by the left-hand side. So this is one just because this is an exact relation. So this is a verification of the identity. And then let me turn, look term by term. So let's first look at the single scale terms. This is a function of scale here. So here's my filter scale normalized by the smallest scale of turbulence theta. So near the small scales, you can see that the fractional contribution is three fourths and one fourth from these two single scale mechanisms. That's because there's, when you're at the smallest scales, you don't have smaller scales that have these multi-scale interactions. So it's the only game in channel. And then if I look at the multi-scale, well, they start out small, but particularly I'm interested in this region here where you see this flattening off. So this is where you see some scale similarity. It is very important because this range might not look very big in this simulation because I have a smaller Reynolds number. But if I think of these larger Reynolds number applications, this range is going to be a very much larger range in the turbulent. And this is going to be the range where I need to do my modeling, this behavior here. And so you can see the various contributions of these various terms. And as I said, the vortex flattening term is pretty small in this range. So when you can sort of add up these various numbers. So if I look at strain self amplification versus vortex stretching, which one is dominating? Well, neither one is dominating a whole lot, but there is more strain self amplification. So, so um, that is verified through this balance. If I look at single scale versus multi scale, this is important because the single scale terms, these can be represented directly in LES without any modeling of reference. It's the multi scale terms that require modeling. And these are about 50. What's more, let's compare the result. Let's look for term by term, how much does each of these look like an eddy viscosity? How, much, how, do, how good is an eddy viscosity approximating these terms? <clears throat> so, this is an idea of of constructing this gamma. I stole this idea from Nicolette's group at Stanford. Basically, you, you take the actual cascade rate and you normalize it by the maximum possible cascade rate if there was perfect alignment between the stress tensor and the, and the resolved rate of strain tensor. So the eddy viscosity assumes this perfect alignment. So if gamma equals one, that means locally it's behaving like an eddy viscosity where you have this downscale cascade. If it's negative one, you have an inverse cascade where energy is going from small scales to large scales. This doesn't happen very often in three dimensional circuits. And zero is when there's no local cascade. But you have a whole range, right? It can go anywhere between negative one and one. And so we can look at the average rate as a function of scale here on the left. The average, you can think of this as sort of a, an alignment efficiency. And we can look at uh, one particular scale in this self similar range. We can look at the distribution, PDF. So you can see the average, this is for the, the sum of the five terms. The average efficiency is something like 40%, right? Not very much like an eddy viscosity. So this is what I was alluding to earlier, that physically, if you look at what the, the subgrid model needs to be doing, the eddy viscosity is not really very accurate. And if we look at the single scale terms, they're actually less efficient in terms of their alignment. But if we look at the multi-scale terms, they have much higher efficiency. In fact, if we look at the distribution, they're much more strongly peaked, close to, close to a, a perfect alignment. Well, not quite, but closer. They're much closer to any viscosity behavior than the full tensor. <clears throat> and then the, this vortex flattening is sort of distributed close to zero. So it's not doing much. So we can see that if we look at these two particular terms, multi-scale strain self-amplification, multi-scale vortex stretching, they're much more like an eddy viscosity than if we try to treat the whole tensor as an eddy viscosity. And so this lends credence to so-called mixed models where you can use, you can write, these blue and red aren't very much like an eddy viscosity, but that you can actually represent them exactly in the large eddy simulation that modeling. And if you, if you represent them accurately and only leave the eddy viscosity to the other terms, you can construct models that at least have more physical accuracy. Okay, so uh, the short version is, is here. If you're interested in learning more uh, in physical review letters, there's a long version in journal fluid mechanics. Um, but, but probably for most of the people here, if you're not a specialist in turbulence, I would recommend instead, uh, I wrote an article last year for Physics Today, which is started for a more general audience, explaining a lot of this, these ideas about the energy cascade. 
All right, so let's go back and think about large eddy simulation again after we've sort of gone on this aside thinking about the physics of turbulence and the energy cascade. So I mentioned some problems with spatial filtering itself. So how can we address some of these problems related to interfaces and boundaries and multi-phase flows and non uniform solutions? So here I'm introducing a, con a new concept <clears throat> to sort of get around some of the difficulties with spatial filtering. So let's think about a generalized velocity depth. It's a function of space and time in a 3D field. And it's also a function of pseudo time. Whereas pseudo time equals zero, it equals the physical velocity field. So think of this in, in a 2D phase space. So I have physical time and I can advance in pseudo time at a fixed physical time. So again, at pseudo time equals zero is the physical velocity field. So if I cruise along this axis here at zero pseudo time, advancing in time, this is my governing equations of fluid flow boundary space. Now, if I want to do some coarsening of the flow, I want to advance in pseudo time. And I can do this by solving a sort of auxiliary Stokes equation. And I, so I solve a Stokes equation, so I freeze the flow, and I solve a Stokes equation in pseudo time, and that Stokes equation coarsens the flow through this viscous effect. And generates, so as pseudo time increases, the resolution link scale or the cutoff link scale increases, and I get a coarser and coarser representation of the flow. But what I really want to do for LES is take a fixed resolution or fixed pseudo time and advance at that resolution. I want to advance in physical time to simulate how the flow is evolving. And so to do this, I need to generate the equations for how, how the, the course and velocity field would, would go along this curve. And to do this, basically what it boils down to is generating a model for residual stress, which is much like our sigma we had before. Essentially, a subgrid stress. But to do this in this framework, I basically assume that regardless of what path that I take between two points, whether I go this way or that way, I end up with the same field at the end, right? And this boils down um, in differential calculus, this boils down to inequality of mixed partial derivatives. So if I take a derivative in pseudo time and then time, or time and pseudo time, it has to be the same. And this is a, a constraint that I can use to derive models for. The residual stress test. So let's first look at the simple case, then we'll look at more complex cases. Let's first look at uniform resolution, no boundaries, right? This is where standard spatial filtering theory does okay. It does pretty well. It's been fairly successful. So again, we have this duality between the integral representation, the classical spatial filtering representation, and my new representation, where now in this case, for uniform resolution, no boundaries interfaces, st the Stokes equation becomes just a diffusion equation, like I showed before in the previous section. So what this shows you is if you take this, you know, unbounded single phase flows with uniform resolution, these are mathematically equivalent. So I'm retaining all the advantages of the standard filtering theory that's been used for LES for decades. But now what I'm doing is I'm generating this expression here, which I can use just like I did before, I can derive this this uh, differential equation in pseudo time, this forced diffusion equation to generate equations for model, right? So I use this mixed partial derivatives to derive this in this framework. Again, where the gradients of W, which is now a resolved velocity gradient, is, is forcing this uh, residual stress to grow as we increase the resolution scale. So we can come up with a simple procedure based on physics inspired coarsening. First, we, we can assume some form of the model. We could take an eddy viscosity. These are very popular and very easy and cheap to implement. So, you know, they're very nice for a number of flows. Very, they're even preferable sometimes, even though they're not as accurate. Or I can take a mixed model, which I alluded to before. So I can take some terms, which can be represented exactly, which may not act very much like an eddy viscosity. And then the other terms, these multi-scale terms can be written in terms of eddy viscosity which is more accurate representation of the physics. Either way, I, I can come up with some form of the eddy viscosity based on scaling arguments, either using the strain rate tensor or just directly using Komolarov scaling theories from the 40s. And I substitute this into the box equation, the force diffusion equation. It gives me an algebraic equation, which I can then solve for whatever these coefficients are and, and complete the description of the model. 
So let's see how this performs. So first, let me do operatory testing. This means I take a DNS at a modest realms number, um, and then I, fil I filter the results after the fact, and I check to see if my, if my model would be predicting the correct behavior. So here I'm looking at the average cascade rate as a function of scale normalized by the total dissipation rate. So in this self-similar regime, this ratio is close to one. The cascade rate is equal to the dissipation rate. And you can see these various models here. In particular, this dynamic Smogorensky model is a very popular model uh, used by my many, many users of LES. You can see how it's performing. It's providing a pretty good estimation of the dissipation rate. And you can, you can compare that to a dynamic viscosity model and a dynamic fixed model, which are the two models I, I derived using the procedure on the previous page. You can see they're also providing pretty good estimations of what the cascade rate is compared to this nonlinear gradient model is only taking these single scale interactions. That's why it only has about half the dissipation rate. Remember we saw this one half, one half ratio before. So this model is more accurate in terms of local representation, but it doesn't have enough dissipation rate. So it doesn't work well as a model practice. You have to supplement it with, in a mixed model with an eddy discuss. You can likewise look in more detail, look at the correlation between the actual stress tensor that you need and what the model predicts. And you can show this nonlinear gradient is actually much more, much better than a viscosity model, right? Because viscosity is not really capturing the physics correctly. Um, we can actually get the best of both worlds by doing this mixed model here. And we can even go further, not just are the, is the model correlated with the correct result? Is it, what's the actual R squared value or what's the error, right? So a higher R squared value means lower error. So again, nonlinear gradient mixed models, because it's capturing this, um, these single scale interactions directly have, have more accuracy than any discussed models. So we can test different models that way. We can also test models by actually plugging the model in and running the large eddy simulation on a coarser grid and then, com then comparing it to what happens if I run the DNS and then filter. So this is sort of where, where the proof is in the pudding. So here's the energy spectrum, again, looking at Fourier space as a function of wave number of the DNS, then I do a filter on the DNS. So I have a filtered energy spectrum here that's dropping off at a lower wave number. And then here are my three models, the classic Smogorinsky model, compared to my two new, I'm calling them dynamic viscosity and dynamic mixed models, based on my physics-inspired portioning. And you can see that in each case, it's dropping off. A, a Gaussian filter is actually a good representation of what the model is doing. And but no more importantly that it's dropping off at the right wave number. So this coefficient that's being predicted by, by the procedure I showed is actually predicting a good coefficient to get this drop off behavior at, at the right scale. We can also look at the details. Let's sort of look at the details in terms of vortex stretching, strain self amplification Is the LES getting the right sort of behavior um, it, as you run it, right? So here we can look at this, for example, omega star. So this is the efficiency. This is essentially this gamma value for the, for the local vortex stretching. Is it getting the right efficiency? This is, has to do with the alignment between vorticity and the strain rate eigenvectors. So it's, it's a very detailed measurement in terms of the local flow topology at the grid scale. And if I, use a, if I use a viscosity model, as you might guess, it's very similar to the distribution of these efficiencies in the flow is very similar to DNS, right? Because essentially what I'm doing is I'm increasing the viscosity. Um, I'm essentially doing something like a direct numerical simulation at a lower Reynolds number by increasing the viscosity. If I use the mixed model and I use more information about the, the local interactions in my modeling, I can get something closer to what you get, what you would actually need to get to get a representation of the filter turbulent field or the core center. So that shows some more details of the benefits of mixed modeling. If you really need to know, if you really need to accurately represent the small scale physics in your simulation. All right, so let me uh, wrap up with a few future directions. So as I said, large eddy simulations classically based on spatial filtering does pretty well if I have uniform resolution without boundaries, et cetera, et cetera. So really I wanna push and test this more. What I've shown so far is sort of first tests in a regime where the classical modeling approach already works pretty well, right? But we have some sanity check that this, this procedure, this, this modeling framework is giving us something. 
Um, but really, I want to push this forward now. So let's think about non-uniform resolution. So here I have a flow that's coarsened more here in the center, and then it has more finer resolution towards the edge, for example. This is just a concocted example, concocted example to show what I mean. And so you have sort of the filtered versus the unfiltered signal shown here. And it's different depending on where you are in the domain. So spatial filtering gives us this commutator error, right? But actually what happens when I use this physics-inspired coarsening, I get a generalized Navier Stokes equations for my generalized velocity field. These equations are now replacing the filtered Navier Stokes equation with a stress tensor and no commutator error. So I, I've eliminated the concept of commutator from the, the spatial filtering framework has to deal with. And I get a divergence for representation. So what happened to the non-uniform grid effects? Well, they all sort of, instead of generating commutator error, they all got lumped in with this stress. But that's okay because now I have this equation for what the stress should be doing. But again, I can use this equality of mixed partial derivatives during my coarsening procedure. And I have this forcing due to the result to the generalized gradients, as we looked at before. I have a generalized diffusion. So a forced diffusion equation again, and now I have additional forcing due to the gradient of the pseudo viscosity. Pseudo viscosity is sort of the local rate at which the, the flow is coarsened by, by the coarsening procedure. And so if I have gradients and resolution, that boils down to gradients and pseudo viscosity in my framework. And this can be written into this expression, and you can use the same, and, and we think you can use the same sort of expressions and get uh, good models to represent non uniform grid effects without commutator errors. And then finally, thinking about multi phase flows, flows near solid boundaries, where some of these effects, for example, you don't want to smear out two phase interfaces where you have surface tension effects and things like this, right? Instead, we think we want to go from something where we have some interface with some small scale details. And really, I want to sort of portion out these small scale details, get an interface that still might be sharp, but now has doesn't have the small scale wiggles and things like that. And I can represent this on a much coarser grid because I don't need to capture some of these smaller scale wiggles. So a, a few things that need to be worked out here, how to choose effective boundary and interface conditions as I do this differential filtering. Right? Now I have to choose boundary conditions, interface conditions. We have some ideas, but we need to work it out. Um, and then if we have a multi-phase effect, can we use, like, a, like we use pseudo viscosity, add a pseudo surface tension to our coarsening differential form and use that to simplify the interface as we, as we coarsen the flow in general and maintain these sharp interfaces. And so you can think of something going from arbitrarily complex flows where we have drops and bubbles forming very... Uh, you know, small scale wiggles and to get to coarser representations with simplified spheres where you can use, for example, spherical particle dynamics as a subgrid model for advancing small drops and bubbles. So we're pursuing the idea that physics inspired coarsening as it's laid out is a good generalizable principle to extend the concept of LES uh, beyond spatial filtering to be able to deal with complex flow physics. Um, so yeah, the details of this were recently published in JFM, if you want to see the details. Uh, but with that, I will wrap up with a bit of an outlook, thinking again about computing, just the idea of computing to real things. So I argued that the brute force approach using DNS is impractical for many flows, and this is going to remain so for the foreseeable future. So we sort of have to get used to this fact that we're going to have to do modeling to simulate your flow. And large eddy simulation is growing in popularity. With spatial filtering, it's been shown very effective for simple flows. And there are open challenges remaining in terms of dealing with wall bounded flows in a robust way, uh, multi phase flows, non uniform resolution. And I only touched on some of the problems here. There's also challenges related to reacting flows and chemistry and, and other effects that can coincide with turbulent flows. So what I showed today is sort of a first step in that direction, thinking about a new framework for LES, physics-inspired coarsening. <clears throat> it has proven physical insight in terms of showing us something about the energy cascade in terms of vortex stretching versus strain of amplification, answering some fundamental questions about how turbulence works. And it has some potential advantages 
in terms of constructing this, this scheme for generating model approximations in the face of complex physics. So the next question really, I mean, I'm just getting started. I'm in my second year as an assistant professor. So uh, really, I'm just getting started. And, and really, I want to know, can, can we demonstrate this and actually demonstrate? Are, are these advantages just theoretical, or they, can they be demonstrated? Um, so with that, oh, I wanted to throw in this. There's an X factor here. So you've probably noticed in the last few years, there's been an explosion in data-driven modeling, using neural networks, et cetera, et cetera. And I just want to point out that if we want to use data-driven modeling for LES modeling in co with complex flow physics, say multi-phase flows, et cetera, et cetera, it requires a clear framework for generating training data or testing data or whatever you're going to use to generate your model. So right now, there's been a number of efforts, for example, in the simple case for unbounded flows with uniform resolution, where you can use spatial filtering to generate test training data and testing data. And you can do very good generating a, a subgrid model. So, but the question is, how, how do we make that for complex physics? We need an extended framework that goes beyond spatial filtering. And so I think this framework here, physics spark listing, can play a role in, in helping advance also on the data-driven modeling side too, as we think about. So with that, I will wrap up and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you. Yes. Um, let me ask a real simple, dumb question. What are the what are interfaces between Just a two-phase interface, like between water and air, where you have okay, surface so, tension? So this is bubbly flow or bubbly flow or drops. Animation. It could it could be air and fuel, for example, in a gas turbine injector where you're trying to do spray atomization uh, upstream of, of, of the combustion process, for example. Or it could be like a breaking wave where you're trying to see well, what's the dynamics of carbon dioxide at the air atmosphere interface? Questions like this. Would that include cavitation? Cavitation is, is an additional complexity, yeah. So, yeah. That, that's a much harder question. Yeah. I would start with the easier ones. But yeah, that, it's a good point because cavitation is a tough problem for a large eddy simulation because there you have small, right? It's really starting at the smallest scales and becoming larger. So it's sort of breaking this behavior that we like to see in the LMS. Yeah. Uh, so, so the... Um... Some of your point out that the, T, uh, the pseudo time and the real time can commute, which is like a, does that mean the LES simulation can kind of match with this instantaneous DNS, future DNS, and every time step? So, generally, you could sort of play computational games where you run a DNS and an LES next to each other yeah. and have them communicate. I mean, the whole point of LES is to not have to run the DNS yes. uh, to um, save on cost. So you want to come up with a model where you don't have to run the DNS. So you use this sort of theory, sort of with pen and paper, or maybe with some sort of pre-constructed modeling techniques, right? Yeah. So when you get to actually running the LES, the model is predefined, and you're not necessarily running these these um, coarsening procedures during your simulation. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to ask the possibility of running an LES that is that matches with future DNS and every time step. Oh, is that ever possible? Not really, because of chaotic dynamics. So it's, it's a good point. It's a good question. So the turbulent dynamics are chaotic, meaning that if I take a snapshot and I slightly perturb it, the difference between those snapshots is going to, they're going to exponentially uh, go away from each other in phase space, right? So if I, there's some predictive time where they'll just diverge from each other, which means even if I make an imperceptible error in my subgrid model, which there's always going to be some errors, you're never going to have a perfect subgrid model. So it, it's practically impossible to have an LES that actually follows a filtered DNS. What you're trying to do is construct something where we typically, we want to know something about the statistics of the flow, the average flow, maybe the variance, if we want to know what the turbulence intensity is, the average forces at some surface, things like this, right? So this, we want to represent the statistics. So you can sort of, and there's some work sort of recasting all of this in statistical form and really thinking about what does an LES mean? model needs to do statistically. And these are also important questions that I, I didn't get into today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you talk about the physical coarsening, uh, how do you determine how coarse, uh, great is 
How do you, like in practice, how would you determine which your grid is? Yeah, so, I mean, this takes some engineering judgment to make a grid. I mean, obviously you're going to be constrained by whatever computer you have. No, no, I understand, but yeah. uh, do you have in advance an idea how coarse it's going to be? For a particular flow, usually you can do better if you have some intuition about the type of scales of flow. So if you have a jet, for example, let's consider the jet, right? You have a width of the jet, you know that it's going to generate large stilettes that are maybe like half the jet width. So you need to be much more than that, right? So you probably need something like 30 grid points across the jet, you know, depend, and this also depends on accurate models. More accurate models may need less resolution, and there's a trade-off there as well. So one of, one of the benefits from doing more intense modeling work might be to try to get better predictions at coarser grid scales too, right? Maybe I can do it with only 20 grid points across the jet instead of 40. Another one. Yeah, go ahead. It's not really a question, it's a kind of brainstorm. So you showed and showed the uh, Gaussian filter is equivalent as running a diffusion equation. I think that's really inspiring. Mm -hmm. So um I'm, I'm thinking about the reverse. So if we have a filtered field and we do the big analysis for the filtered field to so defilter it. Yeah, does it generate something like in that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so if you do defiltering, it would be like writing a diffusion equation with a ne negative viscosity. Yeah. So this is sort of an ill-posed problem, right? Yeah. There's two, I mean, there's sort of information that's lost in the filter procedures. And that's sort of intrinsic to, I mean, you really want that, right? Because you're trying to run a simulation on force of grid. You have to give up information to do that. Right? So you can't really just run it backwards. This is not a practical way to do model. Yes. I'm not sure if this would make sense, but is there a way to compare this uh, methodology with like a K omega or a shear stress transfer type of model? Yeah, so the K omega SST model um, is, is a RANS model, right? So this is all large eddy simulation. RANS is a different framework to work in. So RANS is based on, instead of spatial filtering, it's based on averaging, RANS averaging. So there you're trying to just directly predict the average flow. So you have no resolved motions at all. It's just the average flow in RANS. And, and so the modeling challenge there is a little different. And as you pointed out, KMEG SST, there are other models well established, right? So RANS tends to be cheaper than LES for a given flow. So in, in a lot of scenarios, it's more practical, even though in, in general, at least theoretically, it's less accurate. Um, so that would be the comparison. It, in general, it's going to be cheaper to run something like a K omega model with RANS. Um, and I didn't go into that today. Um, but there are some situations where you need to do hybrid modeling with RANS in some part of the domain and LES in other parts. And these are additional challenges that have to be worked out that the framework like this might actually be able to contribute to. I guess I got a big picture question. Yeah. Just a tiny bit about quantum. <laughs> um, would this speed fit into that and run faster, or would that be a DNS approach, or is that a whole different? Yeah, maybe I should add an extra X factor here. Yeah, okay. I would add an extra X factor I didn't talk about, which is quantum computing, um, which is gaining some traction, gaining some interest now, because they're actually building some decent yeah. quantum computers. Um, so for fluid flows, there's a, still a big question mark. I, I'm still fairly skeptical, though I would be happy to be proven wrong, um, because quantum computing algorithms tend to work well for linear problems, and there's a big question of how to do quantum computing for nonlinear problems. And fluid flow is intrinsically nonlinear, the nonlinear advection term. Um, so yeah, there's some big problems to solve there before we can do turbulence with it. But there's also a big reward too, right, in terms of you know doing things that we may never be able to do with digital. It's a good question. Yeah, thank you. It's a good question to think about for the future. Yeah. Well, in the 50, 60 years, I won't be around. I'll yeah. Break through before that. <laughs> yeah. You might think that. So, in that note, we're going to thank our speaker for more.